Hey everyone, what's up? BQ here. Uh, I want to talk under siege real quick. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, to generalize some thoughts. Uh, I tweeted out earlier, I've been sick as a dog the last week and a half, two weeks. I'm feeling okay at the moment, uh, and it kind of comes and goes. I do not have COVID. I've been tested, and I'm generally a really healthy person, so I'm confused why I've been sick this long. I've been trying to create some content for the channel, and for the most part, I cannot speak more than a few sentences without coughing. Uh, but it comes and goes, and right now, it's gone. I still don't feel great, but I'm able to speak. <laughs> so I'm going to try to uh, generalize some thoughts on Under Siege. I don't want to do like a half-hour review or nothing like that. I just want to give like super bullet point stuff on what I thought about uh, where some of this stuff was going. This was a good show. Let's let's get the positive out there first, the good, okay? The wrestling was excellent. Excellent. Um, I thought the wins meant something for the most part. And um, the commentary was really good. I've been saying lately, you know, like these two are starting to sound really fake to me. I'm sure it has to do with post-production. Um, but they've been sounding really fake. This they sent it really good during this episode, during this this Impact Plus thing. The Impact Plus shows right now for me are a lot easier to digest because of. Um, well, let's get to another positive real quick. The 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 blue background, the blue subtle background, was such a nice contrast that it made the ropes pop, and it was just so much easier for me visually to do to watch. I know a lot of times we're in this day and age where people have opinions about stuff they don't know anything about. And to let you guys know, when I have opinions on things, uh, I have more background knowledge in, in some things than you may realize. Okay, so if I'm sitting here like, you know, well, what's up with all this red, red, red? And, you know, there's people all the time like, I don't see why it matters. I don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't bother me. There's some people it's not going to bother. Um, especially those who are colorblind. But uh, it's not going to bother some people. But I went to school for art. Before I joined the military, I went to school for art for a couple of years. Um, and then during while I was in the, you know, in the middle of active duty, I got a certificate in graphic design. So if you're my Facebook friend, you know I do graphic design because I'm always photo editing. Well, shit, you're a subscriber to this channel, and you see my thumbnails. I clearly know a thing or two about graphics and colors and stuff, you know what I mean? I think I do a pretty good job. But, I, I, but I've taken, you know, color theory classes and stuff like that. And then even, even within my marketing studies, there's stuff about colors. What some of you may not know is that colors represent emotions and feelings. You probably do know that. But there are also actions that colors make you tend to make you want to do so let me give you an example red is is a color that studies shown makes somebody think of food or makes them hungry and then yellow is the secondary to that so he, here's proof think of the burger king logo think of the mcdonald's logo red right Yellow uh, doesn't mean you can't throw some other colors in there, but predominantly you see red and yellow of those companies. Wendy's, you see red, right? Uh, I think Arby's is red. I don't really like that place. So I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, Carl's Jr. Red and yellow. This is not coincidence, okay? Studies show that that is the action that the color red. Makes, it doesn't mean every time you look at red, I feel like eating a fucking hot dog. That's not what I'm saying. But it, it tends to drive people more towards uh, eating than going to a restaurant where the, the logo is purple. You mean, or it's, or it's green. Because, you know, green is uh, kind of the color of, like, vomit or something like that. You know what I mean? Anyway, long story short, I do know from... Color theory for marketing stuff like one of one of too much color is too much. 
it is too busy, it's distracting for a lot of people. You may not even know it's distracting. But it's this, trust me it is. There are, there are little things that you are going to miss because it's, the, the colors have blocked it out. So with this example, nice blue background, I was able to actually appreciate the color of the red ropes. Like I, didn't, I never knew what kind of shade of red they were because everything's always red. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I would have never looked at the ropes and be like, ooh, I really like that shade of red. It, it didn't even think, you know what I'm saying? It didn't even occur to me to look at, at them in that way. But when they had the nice blue background and the, re and the ropes popped out, I was like, yo, that actually looks pretty cool. That's actually a great color for ropes. And then on, on the negative side, though, and it was on my only real negative of the show, uh, what, what's, what's my favorite thing to, to hate? The background music, right? It wasn't even the music itself, the music choice, or even the fact that it was music, period. Because it wasn't the We Own the Night song, so I wasn't, you know, throwing up. It was so loud, you couldn't hear anything. You could barely hear anything. I should put it like that. You could barely hear Eddie Edwards mumbling over the damn guitar riffs. Uh, I don't know how someone can mix down a show and say, okay, this is, this is good. So... Just like I said about uh, graphics and art and color and stuff like that, stuff I have some experience with, I have years of experience in audio engineering and audio mixing. All right? You may not know that. I do. Years. I'm talking from, uh, I'm 41 now. I haven't probably touched anything like that in uh, five, six years. But I probably first started dabbling it in it at age of 24. All right. So I, I know my shit. When, when I would mix down, mix down audio tracks and stuff. And, and I think a lot of people do this when they're engineering. You edit something, you mix it down. You leave it for like an hour, two hours. Then you come back and listen again. Because that... Because you you now have a fresh set of ears. When you're when you're sitting there mixing, listening to something for an hour straight, whatever, it becomes just noise to you. But when you walk away, and come back, you now have a brand new set of ears. And you would hear that that music is too damn loud. I don't. I cannot wrap my head around how someone can live with that result. I don't get it. Let's talk about the matches here real, real briefly. Um, Brian Myers versus Black Taurus. I didn't see it. I, I logged on. I, honest to God, I was watching uh, the uh, NBA. The uh, I'm sorry, the N NBA, but the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. And watching uh, you know Kobe Bryant's induction. So I, I missed the match. I like Black Taurus a lot. Uh, does anybody take more L's than Decay right now? Rosemary lost last week. Decay, uh, you know, Black Taurus loses. They had this little thing with the Good Brothers, this bullshit feud that they put together. When this was one of the legit feuds for the Good Brothers, they could have put together with, you know, someone who wasn't a champion. Uh, bullshit feud where uh, Black Taurus loses, Crazy Steve loses. And then they lose as a team. 0 for 3 was Decay. And then what's their next match after that? Rosemary wrestling number one contender. Loss. Black Taurus wrestling. Loss. Yo, this version of Decay, I like this version of Decay more than the other, to be honest with you, as far as the personnel. But they suck. And it seems like they just put this team together to appease the fans. Uh, oh, hey, we're bringing Decay back. You know what I mean? But they're not doing anything. They're not. Just, they're not gonna wrestle for the tag team championships. They can't beat anybody. They're they're so bad right now that they couldn't be featured in the four way number one contender match with a bunch of teams that got thrown together and a bunch of teams who or they either got thrown together or don't beat anybody. TJP and PD Williams. Then they haven't even been a tag team on Impact. 
unless there was something I missed. I haven't watched the entire episode of the last couple of weeks because I keep seeing the results online before I can finish it. But Decay is so bad right now that TJP and Petey Williams got got into a number one contenders match. So I don't know what they're just a side. There's just a side show. They're just a side act, guys. This isn't Impact's not taking them serious. And then speaking of not taking serious, Susan and Kimberly as a team. If Susie can wrestle, or could eventually wrestle and eventually actually win, why can't Susan semi wrestle? Um, Kimberly like deserves more, uh, more, of more from a partner than that. You know what I mean? It's like when they wrestle, you know that team's not going to win. It's impossible. Impossible. It's like uh, me going out there and wrestling one of these dudes. Like, there's a hundred percent chance of me losing. You know what I mean? So, um, this was just done to further tail- Taylor and Tennille. Um, You know, and I think that you know when we start getting into pay per view predictions and stuff, I'll give you what I, what I think is going to happen there. But you know, that's that's all that this was for. And then uh, Josh and El Fantasmo. Uh, I thought it was really, really excellent. I thought at, at times that El Fantasma was going to win. I wasn't familiar with the dude before he, uh, before tonight. I'm not going to lie to you. When they said El Fantasma was showing up, I thought he was the guy from the magician from WCW in, in like the late 90s. I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments who I'm, who I'm thinking of. But that's, I, I don't even remember it was in WCW. It might have been WWF. It was like a magician that used to do like magic in the ring, like do tricks. So when they say all oh, Phantasma, I was like, dude, that guy's wrestling. So it, I, I don't know. This is my first time seeing him wrestle. He's he's pretty good, um, and this match was was excellent. Um, so that four way tag team title match, uh, I, I missed most of it. Um, I was uh, pausing the show, and then I'd come back and I'd hit play, and it would just take me to live TV, and I, I missed so much of this match. But you got Triple XL, who beats nobody. Madman Fulton and Ace, they beat nobody. TJP, P.D. Williams have officially beat nobody, but they've never even teamed. Shira and Rohit don't beat anybody. That's your number one contenders match. That's how well the tag team division has been treated over the last several months. When you just feed people to the Good Brothers and you allow people to leave the company in, this this is what you're left with. Um, but Fulton and Ace won. That the the safe money was on them winning. Is nothing worth a build anymore? They are wrestling this Tuesday for the titles. Let me tell you why this is important. Why a build is important? Okay. I'm not saying push this to the sl- till Slam anniversary because no one know everyone knows they're not going to win. I'm not saying push it to Slam anniversary like I was with. Josh and, and uh, TJP, or push it to the pay-per-view. But push it out, out two weeks, three weeks, and here is the reason. Remember, I always say you can only do a first time of anything once. But you can maximize that first time because you can do backstage segments between the two. You can do... Just video packages of them talking about each other without actually have doing promos face to face. Impact loves how people run into each other in the hallway. They can do that. You can stretch out first, okay? That's how you make something fresh. I've been talking a lot about the show feeling like it's the same every week. About it not feeling fresh. Like I feel like we're watching the same matches. Because when you're just rushing into this kind of shit, what the hell do you do with Ace and Fulton after this? What do you seriously do with them at this point? You drag this out three weeks, at least you give them three weeks of looking important and relevant on TV because they they have not beat anybody as a team. Fulton doesn't beat anybody one-on-one. So why not make Fulton look like a winner for a couple weeks? Maybe get him a couple wins under their belt against one of these other teams you just threw together. And this is going back to what I said about feeling fresh. How fresh would it feel to hear Finjuice talk about 
someone other than the Good Brothers. You'd be listening to a whole entire different team. Imagine cutting some promos on Ace Austin and MF Fulton for a couple weeks. I'm not saying they're going to cut these scathing promos, but it's not anything we've ever heard before. So you drag out first times. And then the next week we can hear from Ace and Fulton. And then the third week you can have, you can have the match. Like, So you give us the match Thursday. What are they going to do? They're not going to win, but say, say they do. They'll probably wrestle again the next week. Or they'll wrestle a bunch of one-on-one -on -one matches. And then after that we just don't care anymore, you know? Um... It, it, it. Insanity, folks. You know, as I said, with, with your ears, when you're mixing audio, you leave for an hour, come back, and now you're listening with a new set of ears. It's like you, you're hearing it for the first time. So that's where you hear that the errors and, oh, wait, you know what? I got to fix that. It's the same when you let something like this breathe for a couple weeks. If one team is talking one week and then one team the next, it... You're letting a week pass, and it, it, it almost it, it, it prolongs the freshness. You know what I mean? And it's just it's their way of saying these two guys mean nothing as a tag team. Ace and Fulton mean nothing. We just need some challengers. That's what Impact is telling you. The only thing they haven't done this point is give away one of their titles to someone from another company, and then have them defend against someone from another company on their show. And have no one from Impact involved. That's probably the next step. Finn Juice is probably going to wrestle some dudes from Mexico. Let's see if that's what happens. And then we'll talk real quick. Willie Mack and uh, W. Morrissey. I guess Willie Mack's new role is whipping boy. Because someone said it's because his contract is up. But like this dude's been getting his ass kicked for months. And uh, going back to what I said about seeing things for the first time. And what the hell that means something. Seeing something now for like the third or fourth or fifth time means not like Willie Mack looking like he's concussed in the ring and eyes rolling in the back of the head and damn near knocked out cold. Does that mean anything now after Moose had done that to him like three times? Just a curious way of booking the dude. He's just getting his ass kicked. I don't think there's a home for him outside of Impact Wrestling right now. I know NWA wanted him very badly at one point. Uh, and NWA right now is not good. I love it. I loved NWA. I guess I still do. It's not good right now. It is not a good show. Um, so I don't know if that's... That's probably Willie Mack's backup plan. I don't think that's what he would want to do. I'm sure he would prefer to stay with Impact. That's a better show. But at the same time, what the hell are they, do, they doing with them? Just a, uh, we haven't given you one relevant storyline in the three years you've been with the company, and you, we just send you out there to get your ass kicked. So, you know, what do you think about that? After he went on one on one with one, one on two, I mean, with the North at Bound for Glory a couple years ago, and was a, a freaking star. I mean, this is what this is what we've come to. We can't even, uh, you know, not get knocked out cold in a one on one match. Okay. Deanna and Havoc, this was the best uh, Havoc has looked in a while. And uh, this was a match they gave away the winner. Uh, the number one contender match, Rosemary and Havoc, they gave away that winner uh, two weeks prior when Havoc had the backstage running with Deanna. You know what? Why have the number one contender match at that point? Just, just so Rosemary can take another loss. Cool. But this was the best Havoc has looked. It's probably her best match in Impact, I think. Because Deanna can get that out of people. Deanna gets a tap out win on Havoc. I'm going to say something bold here. This is not insider information. I haven't talked to anybody. Nothing like that. I think that's Havoc's last match with the company. That's how that match felt to me. You got rid of her partner. Uh, she, you're clearly not going to put the title on her at any point. Uh, there's no one with her, no one for her to feud with. So, what are you gonna do? There's nothing for her. You can put her with Decay, give her a fourth member, another girl. They don't, they don't beat anybody. So what? You know, you'll fit right in. Uh, 
I mean, I would imagine being Sammy Callahan's old lady, they don't want to get rid of I mean, they do a good job, I'm saying, uh, not that they don't want to, but they do a good job keeping couples together for the most part. But I don't feel good about that, about watching Havoc uh, tap out. So I felt like that came across as her last match with the company. We'll see if that's what really happens. Uh, Fire and Flava got the titles back versus Jordan and uh, Rachel. So one of the other bad things I'm going to point out here. And to you guys, this means, you know, it's minute, you know. But, but bad things, when you correct a bunch of little bad things, they snowball into one good thing. And the results can be very, very favorable. Let me take NWA, for instance. Let me get right back to this match. Let me tell you why NWA is bad right now. The commentary is horrible. It is uh, like it is notches below uh, Josh and, and Madison. It, it's very bad. You have Velvet Sky on commentary. Think of Madison Rain's first time on commentary when she was like now she's good, but when she think about when she was bad when on Pop TV, divide that by like ten, subtract another twenty, um, and then multiply by zero, and that's the talent level you have. For Velvet Sky on commentary. I mean, uh, we all got to start somewhere, but she is like four years away from being four years away. It's, and I like Velvet Sky, I'm a fan, but like that is not the role for her. Uh, so the commentary is bad. The audio levels are horrendous. Uh, with the commentary, especially, they all have different volumes on the headsets. The uh, microphones that they use are cheap. For interviews, they don't speak at the same volume, so the interviewer will talk and then the wrestler will yell into the microphone and it's staticky and distorted. Uh, the ring slams are way too hard, like the way the sound, the ring sounds, is it, to where you can't even hear um, Velvet Sky or Tim Storm talk on commentary. You can only hear Joe Galli, the lead guy. They have a fake crowd of uh, employees. And it's not like the AEW fake crowd where they're just like genuinely reacting. Like they're, boo, yay. And it, I mean, it sounds horrible. Um, and it's very loud. It's uh, louder than the match itself. So it's actually very annoying. The backstage interviews are bad. Uh, Mae Valentine, she's very hot, but she's horrible at her job. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. She does uh, this NBA, pow NBA, NWA Power Surge show where she interviews people. And she does, she's really good there. But in the backstage roll with a microphone like she's not it's it's like two different people um so the backstage interviews are are not good uh they, they got austin idol who i think they think is their paul Heyman, who can cut these long promos and get people over like he's the manager of tyrus oh dude they, they stink man like he talks forever and i'm like shut up and then um you know you lose guys like uh, and the promos aren't as good but i mean you lose guys like eli drake and and kingston and and these who thank God they have the Pope, my God, you know, someone who can talk. But you're replacing some really good guys with, with, with these dudes, Jordan Clearwater and Slice Boogie, like trying to replace Ricky Starks. Like they're, you know, you're bringing in Tyrus and Chris Masters as guys replace. Dude, they're not on the same. I'm not saying I don't I dislike any of those people. They're not on the same talent level. So they have so many things wrong. And, and a lot of them are little things, but if you start tweaking and fixing all these little things, like once you fix all those things, it's going to be a brand new show. And it's going to feel and look completely different. So trust me, get rid of the background music, get rid of all the red. It'll feel like a different show. But here's the other thing. Stuff like this matters in the presentation of a show. What am I talking about? Jordan Grace, Rachel Ellering come out. We all know Jordan Grace's entrance. They come out to Jordan Grace's music. Rachel Ellering climbs, climbs the turnbuckles that are meant for Jordan Grace. It's part of her entrance. Rachel Ellering, you know, is doing some generic rah-rah, I'm the champion stuff. 
But what happens normally? Jordan Grace climbs a second rope. I love her entrance, actually. I like her music, too. She flexes, smiles, mad dogs, camera zooms out. Pans a little, zooms out. All right? Jordan, I mean, uh, Rachel Ellering climbs the turnbuckles. And the camera even did the same zoom and, zoom and pan on her. And Jordan Grace was left to stand flexing in the ring. Um, and why does this matter? Because Jordan Grace's music was playing. Her entrance takes priority. It's different if they have their own music together. It's what they do whatever. It was Rachel Ellering's music. It's her music. It's Jordan Grace's music. She has the priority to come out as she does to the music. The camera knows how to work with her during her entrance. So Rachel Eller, I mean, uh, Jordan Grace is left standing, flexing in the ring, looking like the secondary wrestling, the secondary wrestler to her own entrance theme. To her own entrance, period. She looked like the, the secondary person of the team. So, um, those are rules. That, that's just simple television. You know what I mean? Um, and maybe that's not as glaring to some people as the things I mentioned earlier about loud music. But presentation matters. You know? It matters a great deal. I was surprised to see Fire and Flava win the titles back. Um, but then I kind of wasn't, too, because they're great champions. And, like... I'm a big Rachel Ellering fan. I have been for years. Like, she's looking rough in the ring. Like, she's not looking crisp. So, Fire and Flava got it together. So, keep the belts on them then. Put the belts back on them. Um, I thought the way the match ended, I don't want to say it was flat, but it, it kind of hit us out of nowhere. Like, headbutts are off the second run. That hits it with a random frog splash and wins. Like, that was just out of the blue. But Jordan... Looked so good during the match. I thought she like came across really well, like a lot of just star power and her, the moves in it. Like I was like, "Fuck, you know, she looks great." But then you come to you know talk about the entrance of the match. She didn't come across as the star of that group, and she took the loss. You know, so that, that kind of sucks because I thought her performance was really good, and uh, they resigned her, so that's good. I didn't think that was going to happen. They they need to keep her. Then. Uh, Eddie and um, Finjuice taking on uh, the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega in the main event. You know, this match ended the way I thought it would. Eddie Edwards hitting the Boston Knee Party on Carl Anderson, getting the win. That's what that's how I thought it was going to end. This was, um, But it was a good match. It was a lot of fun. I was looking forward to it quite a bit. And I think as long as they sprinkle Kenny, Kenny Omega on, you know, don't overkill him, but, you know, sprinkle him into the show as far as him wrestling, um, his match is always going to, you know, draw eyeballs. So this was a good match. If Eddie Edwards ever wants to wrestle uh, for the Impact title, he needs to dr lose the hairdo. You know, like, I hope he gets it out of his system now. Uh, lose the hairdo and uh, look like you're serious about wrestling for the world title. And that's all i got to say about that. I love Eddie Edwards. Just, um, just my opinion. Uh, again, presentation, presentation, presentation. That isn't, is not the hairstyle of a world champion. Um, let's take it to the next match, and then I'm going to kind of tie all this together. But it was the number one contender, Moose, Sammy, Trey, Saban, Bay, Cardona. Uh, I'd, be, I'd look forward to any, Kenny, Kenny wrestling any of these guys. I could probably cross a, put an X to Matt Cardona as soon as uh, they announced this match, like you knew he wasn't going to win. Uh, you know they're not going to have him face Kenny Omega at any point. That's... A guarantee. But um, most people wanted a Moose to win. I thought Sammy was going to win. Um, but here's the deal, okay? Moose won. Moose looked excellent, by the way. Excellent. They announced Moose is going to wrestle Kenny Omega again against all odds, which is like the week before Slammiversary. How the hell are they? I mean, I'll, I'll give them. I don't know what they're going to do yet. I don't know how they're going to handle the Slammiversary main event currently. But that's odd to, to have Moose uh, wrestle on Impact Plus the week before. Um, Kenny Omega's not going to lose on Impact Plus. Let's just get this out of the way. Moose is not going to win, folks. Moose is the shit. He's probably the best talent in Impact Wrestling. 
He's not going to win. He's not going to beat Kenny Omega. He's going to have an amazing match. He is not, 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 listen, not going to win. There's a story here that involves Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan with Kenny Omega. Okay? Moose won the number one contender match. Moose is not going to beat him. Number one reason, Moose has never won a championship at Impact Wrestling. Don't count the Grand Championship. Don't count the TNA Championship. He has not won a title currently recognized by Impact Wrestling. So he's not going to beat the belt collector, world champion of another U.S. television company. He's going to put on a great match. It's going to be a great story. He's Mr. Impact Wrestling. He waves the flag for Impact. People are going to be behind him. There's going to be, he's going to get, get a lot of momentum out of it. He's not going to win. There's three people in this story. Moose, Sammy, Eddie. And Moose is always part of the picture. You could, you could probably even have gotten away with a throwaway title match with Chris Saban at one point. But Moose was in the picture because he was in Hard to Kill. So there's three dudes we're talking here. Whoever is third from this group is the only one who has a chance of winning the Impact title from Kenny Omega. Okay? So it's not Moose. He's first. Sammy or Eddie, whoever it is between those two, whoever's last is going to either beat Kenny or have the only actual shot at beating him out of this group. You can just cross everyone off the list. Unless unless um, unless they have a chance at Samoa Joe, which is possible, look at the contract that Good Brothers have. I think the Good Brothers contract is a blank sheet of paper with an X and a dollar amount. And they just just sign this, and we'll give you this money, and uh, that is it. Have fun, okay? That's what uh, Samoa Joe's contract will look like. Okay? So they'll say, but sign here. We're gonna let you beat, have you beat Kenny Omega. Uh, you know, fuck these other guys. I've been under a company contract for a while. Like, you come come beat Kenny Omega. All right, we're gonna play some old Samoa Joe's matches up the ass, uh, seven days a week. Uh, on, on Twitch, on, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Like, it's going to be Samoa Joe Central. That's what his contract's going to look like. But if he does not come over, it's going to be one of those two guys. That's the way they did the story. I wish they wouldn't have. You know, if you look at AEW, and Darby Allen was the uh, champion. I just, you know, I was actually standing next to Darby Allen last night. He's probably like 5'6". Like, he's a lot smaller than I thought he was. Um, and he's very skinny. He's very petite. I thought he was... I'm not trying to make fun of him. I thought he was a kid cosplay as him at first. And I was like, oh, shit, that's actually him, you know? Uh, but my point is, he's a little dude. But they found a way to make him make him feel very, very important. They put a title on him. And people could not take that title off him for a long time. And he ultimately lost ultimately lost to Miro this past week in the main event. I mean, and he, he, he main evented shows. Like, Josh Alexander needs the main event Impact going forward until Kenny drops the title. That's going to elevate that belt. Impact won't do that. Anyway, uh, Darby Allin's been in main eventing the show forever. And then he eventually lost to Miro. There was no storyline that, like, you, you, like, from three months ago, like, oh, this is setting the groundwork for Miro to... Take the title off Darby Allen in three months or nothing. You know what I'm saying? You didn't. You, that didn't happen. He just wrestled every week defending it, and then he lost one day. And that's how I wish they would deliver this Kenny Omega thing, where they just keep sending him challengers, and we don't know who's gonna beat him. Someone just does, and it goes over like gangbusters. You know what I'm saying? But most likely, we're gonna have an idea who ultimately wins, because they're forecasting stuff. He's, he's, Moose isn't going to win because Kenny has to fight these other guys. AW did this the past week. They made uh, they they uh, won the their tag team match with uh, Christopher Daniels and Frankie Kazarian, and then they said, "Okay, next we're going to wrestle Varsity Blondes because they're the next number one contenders." And then we're also challenging Moxley and Kingston at the pay per view, like. You just told us you're challenging these guys at the pay. They're challenging. They're the champions, but they put the challenge out for a match at the pay per view. So 
the match you just said you were going to have next week, we know you're going to win because you have to wrestle and defend the titles against those guys. You know what I mean? Like, I hate forecasting stuff. I don't know if I painted that picture clearly enough. But you, you have to forecast stuff. And that being said, being a number one contender needs to matter. Uh, you know, they actually, I was listening to a podcast, they use that same example, AEW. Like, Varsity Blondes, they just out of the blue, because they're the number one contenders, just get a title uh, match with no build. And then when they lose, what do you do with them after that? You know? So, Moose is number one contender. Um, well, that's, you know, kind, kind of going back to Fulton and Ace, like, them being the number one contenders, they can't even bask in it. It means it, it needs to mean something, and it doesn't because they're just going to get the match and then go back to doing nothing. You know, at least with Moose here, he can uh, enjoy being the number one contender for for a bit. You know, he said at the end of the match, "Number one contender, I'm getting back with ours." Like, yes, you know, make that make those words mean something. Number one contender, but it also doesn't mean anything because he's not. We know he's not going to win now because of them forecasting a story. They wouldn't build something towards Sammy and Eddie if Moose was going to take the title off him, you know? So, again, his status, him winning this match, what does it mean? It doesn't mean a whole lot now. But it's still something we're going to really, really look forward to. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think Sammy is going to end up wrestling the Good Brothers at the pay-per-view most likely have like a mystery partner. I don't think they're going to announce the partner there. I think it'll be, you know, someone from like Mexico or Japan or probably not Mexico, but someone from like Japan or something like that. That's what I see happening. Um, or Impact might even ask for another AEW dude to team up with them, you know? Because they got guys. Um, I'm trying to, you, you know what? Sammy Kelly, there's no way they're going to do this. This is straight up fantasy booking, but Sammy Callahan, I think, used to be partners. With John Moxley on the Indies, something about Switchblade, something or something along those lines. Uh, if they were able to pull that off, then you got something big there. They're probably not going to do that. I'd I'd be shocked if they could pull that off. But um, that that's you know that's it for what I got for you guys with uh, Under Siege. Fortunately, that's feeling pretty good. I just had hit pause a few times, and. Um, that was it. I did say I was going to not talk for half an hour. I still did. I guess I just can't help myself. I will talk to you guys soon. Peace.